Good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to the Israel Institute for Advanced Studies and to Jerusalem, those of you who are, are coming from abroad. Uh, I'm Itzik, I'm the director of the Institute for Advanced Studies, and it's really a great pleasure to welcome you here, um, especially after three years of COVID that we had to uh, uh, cancel and reschedule and again reschedule um, this uh, school for advanced studies. Um, it's the fifth time that we are having you here, and it's a great pleasure. Um, the Institute is hosting six similar uh, um, schools for advanced studies in various disciplines. Most of these schools are directed by uh, Nobel Prize laureates and their equivalents, and they attract lots of attention uh, throughout the world, and I'm really happy that you get a chance to be part of this uh, uh, fantastic endeavor at the uh, Institute. So all that is left for me to do is to thank uh, Nir and uh, Michal for taking care of this uh, school and organizing the, uh, the program. And um, wish you all a pleasant and fruitful time here at the Institute. Thank you. Hi, um, so I'm Nir Friedman, and together with Michal Rosa and Sri, we are uh, the, the, the Nobel Prize equivalent deputize somebody else who deputize someone else who deputize us, and we, we are the actual organizers. Um, so there is a chain of command. Um, so it's great to have you here. Um, I thought we would start, the idea is to have a school where we are not a huge group of people, so the idea is really for learning, so ask questions, uh, let's keep this interactive. Um, we, we made the decision that hopefully will work out, that we'll try to have hands-on session and not just theoretical discussion. Um, for me, at least, as an experiment. Michal tried it in, in the past and it worked, so we hopefully it will work again. And, and but. Uh, do feel free to give us feedback on, w you know, in real time so we can help fix things. Um, I think it's imp important to introduce Anat, who is in charge of everything that is not... Good yeah, I, you're going to say a few words or just... No, just welcome to the school. If there is any yeah. uh, problem, uh, you're, feel free to talk to us. So Anat or your team can <laughs> solve every problem on the world. Um, and um, so we are going to to have uh, s several long sessions, and then usually in the morning and in the afternoon we'll have shorter sessions which more varied nature. Um, and, and we also have a, a trip in Jerusalem that for those who were in Jerusalem, I recommend doing it again because Jerusalem is every time you've been to the old city and discover something new. So even if you feel you've seen it, I urge you to come. And Michal, do you want to say a few words beyond this? So thank you very much for coming. And this is a pleasure to have you on this Sunday morning. I will do some housekeeping just so that you are aware of everything you can benefit from in the, in the next five days. First, we have the um, wonderful opportunity to get access to data of Shari Tzedek. You will hear more about this hospital that is not very far away from here, and some people from the hospital are around here, somebody is sitting downstairs also. To get access to the data, you need to sign a document. If you didn't see it in the email, you can go downstairs and talk at the, de uh, at the desk downstairs and find out more details. And signing will give you access for five days to whole data of the past year of people who were hospitalized, it's of, car of course anonymized. People who were hospitalized, their medical data, um, um, medicine, diagnosis, procedures, all of it. And then you can ask yourself questions that come up through the sessions of this uh, week and try to see if you can find answers. Two things to know about this data access. One is that it's gonna end at the end of the week, but if you're part of a, a large group who wants to continue collaboration, whatever you do can be freezed and kept 
And then you need to go into direct negotiation and agreement with the hospital on a follow-up project. So it's a possibility, but it's not an automatic thing. You would need to, to go through that second phase. That's one thing. The other thing is that the, the virtual room that you would have access to is a CPU uh, computing machine. You can get GPU. Uh, if you have a good reason to want to have a GPU, we, we made that available for users who are interested. You need us to let us know as quickly as possible. Let us, I mean the Sharit Tzedek people who are downstairs. And then you can get for the full week to apply deep learning and other things through a GPU environment. So this is about Sharit Tzedek. About the rest of the things, you have here, as uh, Neil said, uh, talks with exercises or uh, on, uh, hands on activity. And our hope is that all the speakers, I'm looking at Daphna, but also others, uh, came with another person who is more reachable. And if you have other questions, follow up, you want to collaborate, you want to come up with your own ideas, feel free. That's part of the idea of the brain trust of what we are going to have here today, today and the next five days. So thank you very much for coming, and I'm very, very happy. Well, welcome in the poster. Yes. If anybody didn't send poster. All the posters, yeah. Yeah. We are going to have posters. So if you come with a, came with a poster, you can already <coughs> uh, put it downstairs. You might have seen the place. You can ask at the desk downstairs. We will have spotlights. And the spotlights are organized in two sessions. So whoever has a poster, please make sure that you send your slide to IIS, to the school. Ilana is handling that. And the order by which you will present is the order in the um, agenda. So you can uh, log, um, get into the page where you have the agenda. You can see all the posters numbered. And the first uh, four or five will be the first section, and the rest will be the second session. Any Anything else, Nina, I forgot? No. No? Anything else you want to ask at this very moment at the beginning of the day? OK. So I'm very pleased to invite Professor Daphna Shachaf, who is uh, the head of Data Institute here, and she can tell you more about it, especially that we gave you a few more minutes to tell us about what you're doing here before you tell us about the technologies. Okay, sounds good. Thanks a lot. Let me just plug in everything. co-directing CIDR, our Center for Data Science at the Hebrew. Uh, you want me to say a few words about CIDR? Sure. Um, the goal of CIDR that's most relevant to this school is to help people analyze their own data without having to kind of beg for time of somebody from statistics or somebody from computer science. So we want to give people the tools to be able to do whatever they want on their own data. Uh, if you have more questions, yes, we have more time for doing it. But today, I'm going to give you a short intro to text mining, natural language processing, basically what to do when you have textual data. Now, when I started preparing for this talk, I tried to understand who you guys are, like what, what skill set you come with, and here's the answer I got, and I'm pretty much quoting. First of all, they're a really heterogeneous group, make no assumptions, and the second, you're the first talk of the first day, so your goal is to bring everybody up to speed. Okay, so that's kind of what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to get you all up to speed on what to do when you have textual data. Uh, if this is too basic for you, just make some annoyed sounds and I'll just switch to talking about my research or about CIDR or really about anything you want to talk about. Sounds uh, like a deal? Good. So more concretely, the goal of this talk, it's not going to be a technical talk. It's no, not going to be state of the art. I mean, state of the art is going to change while I'm giving this talk anyway. Uh, my main goal is to get you to know the terminology. So when you have a problem in your own research, in your own work, you know what to search for and you know go and find what the state of the art is. But I want you to understand what you're looking for, what, what's the lingo. We'll also talk about challenges in working with text, about limitations of current uh, state of the art. And then we're going to talk about the basic uh, processing pipeline. Okay, so again, what to do when somebody throws a pile of text at you. Yes? Okay. So, uh, text, machines that understand natural language have been kind of central to the AI vision since forever. Right? In pretty much all the all science fiction movies, books, you have robots 
and computers that can speak in natural language, they can interact, you know, sometimes it's, and it's badly, sometimes it's not, but, but it's usually there. And it makes sense, because language is in some sense the ultimate user interface. Like, wouldn't it be awesome if you could, say, order a movie ticket with an interaction like this? Okay, so I decided, like, making a phone call, like, hey, where's the Bugs Life playing in Mountain View? And the robot is saying, a Bugs Life is playing at a Century 16 theater. When is it playing there? It's playing 2 p.m., 5 p.m., 8 p.m.? Okay, I'd like one adult with children for the first show. How much would that cost? Supernatural, right? Now, if you start to understand what's actually happening here and what you're requiring this poor robot to actually be able to do, this gets a bit more tricky. Because in red, you see what we call domain knowledge. So when I say a bug's life, a bug's life is a movie. Mountain View is a place. A discourse knowledge, meaning when the lady says, when is it playing there? What does it refer to? What does they refer to? When she said, how much would that cost? What does that refer to? Again, it, it's like stuff that we do naturally. But you know, every time I kind of try to think about it more deeply, I'm mind blown that we manage to interact with each other. There's so much going on <coughs> under the hood. Uh, green is what we call world knowledge. So when I said I'd like to buy one adult and two children, I'm not doing like human trafficking. I want to buy one adult ticket, one children ticket, or two children ticket. The first show would be 2 p.m., right, and not 8 p.m. Again, stuff that seems supernatural to you, but where is this robot supposed to get all this information from? Now, in our context, in the context of uh, biomedical, are you getting it lower? Because, excellent. Um, so, you know, there's an explosion of biomedical text. I'm not going to bore you with graphs showing exponential growth. You've all seen them. That's kind of preaching to the choir. But w where are they coming from? Where do you get biomedical texts? And here you wanted to make this interactive. So, opening this up, where do you get those texts from? Okay, doctor's notes. Excellent. Where else? Too early in the morning? <laughs> I feel it. Hmm? Did the you internet. say? Internet. Okay, that's kind of broad, but I'll take it. <laughs> so, the two main sources that people usually come up with are patient care data. Something you're going to probably hear a lot of times this week is the electronic health records, EHR. Stuff like the medical history, the discharge summary but also biomedical research data. There's lots of people writing papers, right? Uh, probably you're gonna be some of them. What Nir said is actually what I don't usually hear people say, but it's very much true. You have lots of interesting works on biomedical data, taking their data from online forums, from social media, stuff like, do people complain on Reddit about taking two medications and having this weird side effect? Uh, are people getting like postpartum depression? Can you see this from their social media activity? So there's lots and lots of interesting data in kind of less uh, standard places, if you're actually looking for it. One more interesting thing, in, in my own research, I usually deal with natural language where this is everything you have, okay, where you don't have anything external. But in biomedical case, you often have this data accompanied by many, many other types of data. You have numerical data like blood tests, you have date and time, you know, admission to the hospital, date of birth, whatever. You have uh, time series. ECG, uh, you have medical images maybe, you have lots and lots of categorical variables ranging from on one hand ethnicity to, you know, bi biomedical community seems to me from as an outsider as somewhat obsessed with uh, controlled vocabularies. My favorite, and I thought I'm going to make a quick detour just in case you don't know it, how many of you know ICD-9 or ICD-10? Okay, good. So, really briefly. ICD-10, a system used by physicians to code diagnosis, symptoms, procedures, usually for talking with insurance, okay, for making claims. But the reason I kind of love and hate it at the same time is that <coughs> they're trying to cover things so much. If you actually go deep, you, you find some completely insane codes there. Some of my favorites, struck by Orca, initially encounter. <laughs> I That's don't. True. That's real, totally real. You could, there's also second encounter, yeah. <laughs> if you're really unlucky. There's also struck by turtle, struck by a uh, pelican or toucan, I can't remember which one of them, but something completely unreasonable. Uh, burned due to water skis on fire, subsequent encounter. I don't know. Bizarre personal appearance. <laughs> and sibling rivalry. Now, at some point, I really want to meet the people who coded up those things and ask them what on earth they were thinking. <laughs> if I ever do this, I'm going to come back to you and tell you the answer. Well, if, you, if you're in psychology, I can see this is very relevant. Oh, so 
But you you'd claim to the insurance that this person is here because of sibling rifle? Well, you know, it's a symptom that manifests. I, I suspect they took all the nouns that appeared in, in the medical text or something. Oh, so I think you also have like orca rivalry, if I dig even deeper, maybe. Okay, anyway, really fun uh, place to, if you're ever bored, go and look it up. Okay, now I'm going to just give you like an 80 miles per hour version of NLP applications. Like what can you do with text? And what I want you to do is at the back of your head, kind of try to understand whether this is relevant for whatever problem is interesting for you, okay, for your own use case. But hey, let's make it interactive again. So, what are the like the main things you can do with text? Other than everything, <laughs> what can you do with text? Summarization. summarization. Yes, I heard summarization. Yes, I'm gonna have a slide about it. But, but making long documents shorter. Everybody has attention spans of goldfish, basically. Somebody else says something. Name. Name identity recognition. That's what you said. Yes. Okay, you're stealing my slides. I like that. I'll get to the identity recognition, but basically you have text, you want to extract entities from it, whether it's like people or places or proteins or whatever is interesting for you as entities. One more and then I'll continue. Q&A. I heard Q&A and I heard what? The identification. The identification? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. I'll have that I don't know if I'll have, but Q&A I'll definitely have, so let's start. First thing, probably the most obvious one is classification, right? You do classification, you just have textual data instead of you know, numerical data. Classical example is you have an email, you want to classify the spam or not spam based on the text, based on meta information, who's the sender, where was it sent from, so on. Here's kind of a more, <laughs> more complicated example of not just spam versus not spam, but automatic labels. So your friend is sending an email about hiking trip on Saturday and you get the automatic label of hiking. Okay, classification. Uh, prediction tasks. Um, so for example, you're an article and you have those annoying things at the bottom of, hey, you might also be interested in reading that, kind of a mini recommenda recommendation system. But again, it's kind of basically about similarity, right? The text you read is really similar to those articles. How do you define similarity? Sentiment analysis. Okay, sentiment analysis is basically the task of you have a text and you want to understand its sentiment. There are different scales. You can have just positive, negative, and neutral. You can also have uh, scales involving is this person angry? Is this person sad? Is it happy? Um, if you want to use sentiment analysis in your application, just beware. It sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Really depends on the data. Really depends on what your classifier was trained on. How, um, how is it? Yeah. Is this a specific classification task, or is it something completely different? So it's just a very popular one. So I decided to give it its own slide. But yeah, you can think about it. Just a classification one. More like regression. Well, I, again, depends on what your output variable is like. Um, but it just something that, okay, I teach an intro to data mining class, and pretty much every year I have students like, yes, we're going to take Twitter, we're going to do sentiment analysis on it, and then they kind of get really depressed that it doesn't work, so I decided to give it its own slide. Okay, machine translation, you said it, one of the first things. Actually, I used to have an entire slide with uh, you know, machine translation fails but it gets much better recently. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to spur this. But I it used to be that every time I used to translate, say, from Hebrew to English, it sounded like Yoda. <laughs> now it's much, much better. Summarization, you said this already. Uh, I'll just edit. There's also a setting that's interesting of multi-document summarization. So you have multiple documents, and you want to end up summarizing all of them into something hopefully coherent. This might be relevant in your case. Question answering. Okay, I love question answering because it has multiple levels. Okay, there's the most basic one, like this is a factual question. What's the capital of Wyoming? And you know, search engines today are trying to even just give you the answer, not just give you a link to a page that has the answer, just we think we know the answer, that's the answer. But you can also think of uh, what's on winning Jeopardy. Do you remember uh, Jeopardy? What's on winning Jeopardy? Yes, this, this, yes you remember? Okay, yeah, one. Wow. Doesn't count, so Jeopardy is this kind of trivia TV game show, and uh, they're asking really annoying questions uh, that are completely convoluted in natural language. You're supposed to guess the entity they're talking about. Watson warned us uh, this was considered highly unlikely, a huge victory for AI. Um, you can also ask you know, serious questions. 
it works a lot of the time, it doesn't work a lot of the time. You know, every now and then it seems to make sense, but then you ask Siri, how much does a polar bear weigh? And you get an answer of like one kilogram. Okay, so common sense, less so. Uh, language comprehension, again, you get a piece <coughs> of text, like uh, Christopher Robin is alive and well, he's the person you read about in Winnie the Pooh. And then you get questions like who wrote Winnie the Pooh and where did Chris live? And you're supposed to answer them based on this text. Um, okay, this was just a single question, but you can extend it to entire dialogues, right? And the difference in dialogue systems is that, you know, the, the agent is supposed to oh, get kind of a mental state of the conversation. Like, what did I answer just before? What are we talking about? The, what I call discourse before? Uh, so those are those completely annoying automated uh, assistant in websites. You know what I'm talking about? But how much did it, uh, did it take me to get to ChatGPT? Something like five minutes? Okay, ChatGPT, if you haven't played with it, go play with it. It's amazing, it's highly entertaining. Um, again, it's hard to do your homework for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, if a student of mine actually came up with a really nice solution where she said students are allowed to use ChatGPT to do homework, but they have to clearly mark the parts that are generated, and they have to agree that if they have a mistake in those parts, it's going to cost them twice as many points. Mm. Which I think is a really nice uh, system. Here's just one thing, uh, okay, you know, the entire Twitter is full of people trolling ChatGPT, but that's just one I really love. Was Lincoln assassin on the same continent as Lincoln when the assassination occurred? So he said Lincoln was assassinated by uh, John uh, Wilkes Booth uh, while he was attending a play at Ford Theater in Washington, D.C. I don't know where this guy was at the time of the assassination, but this is uh, North America, so perhaps he was in North America, perhaps he wasn't. <laughs> Which is like, I mean, it, I don't even know what to call it. It's like, every now and then it seems to make sense, and then it just crashes on things that three-year-olds would be embarrassed to make this kind of mistakes. Okay? So, I guess I'm trying to tell you there's huge progress in those things, but we're not quite there yet. So especially if you're doing medical applications, like I would not ask ChatGPT for medical advice, okay? <laughs> Please do not. <laughs> I would also not ask the internet for medical advice, but that's it. Okay, natural language instruction, you have Siri, you have Amazon Alexa, there's lots of stuff you can tell it to do for you. Uh, wake me up 6 a.m., play this song that I really love. Okay, name that recognition, yes. So name and the recognition, like we said, is a very common task where you have text and you want to identify expressions that correspond to entities. Now what does entity mean? Depends on your problem. Usually when you say this in NLP, it means uh, people, companies, <coughs> places. Okay, so you see the sex, Luke, Rowan, Joan, Amy, whatever this is, as a data scientist. So okay, this, this pen of text is a person. This is some organization. This is a location and so on. Now in biomedical context, this might mean something completely different. The entities you might care about are, might be diseases, medication, lab tests, proteins, genes, you name it. Okay, and one thing that makes it very challenging in the biomedical domain is inconsistencies in names. I mean, you also have it in the kind of non-biomedical domain, but it seems like, I'm sorry, I'm going to insult everybody here, like, but they seem really, really, kind of trigger happy to go and make up new names for the same thing in biomedical data. So drugs, they have their trade names, their chemical names, uh, generic substances, synonyms, lo lots and lots of ways to refer to stuff. And uh, lots of people kind of trying to, to merge. I said earlier that there's lots of people trying to do controlled vocabularies, especially to, to kind of counter this. Um, for example, one thing you might, again, hear a lot about is the UMLS, okay, United Medical Language System. But again, uh, there's, there's just lots of stuff, and also lots of, uh, I'm thinking about to talk about this later, there's also lots of um, abbreviations, like, you know, three-letter acronyms that mean totally different things. Okay, this was kind of, uh, you know, name that the recognition is one form of structure extraction, but there's the more general problem of information extraction. That's really broadly defined as you have unstructured text, and you want to extract some structure from it. So for example, you might want to fill this table. So like there's a person working in his company, this is his role, and whether he started working there or ended working there, this is just one potential data structure. And then you take those sentences, and New York Times call named Russell, whatever, president and general manager, and you make him in this company, president and general manager, starting. 
Okay, it's kind of a more general thing. It's just you have unstructured thing. Computers work best when you have structured data. Let's try to make this structure. And I guess one of the most popular kind of structure we can extract is relation. Okay, a semantic relation between concepts, clinical or not clinical. So you have sentences. There's no way on earth you can read this. I'm going to read this for you. Uh, so you have sentences like a brain mass and a spinal cord were identified in the cranial cavity of whatever. And then it's a, well, there are two entities here, spinal cord and uh, cranial cavity, and the relation I identified between them is anatomic structure has location. Okay, this is useful, right? Why, why is the structure way more useful than the natural language? It's not a tricky question. <laughs> Again, what? It's a lot easier to yes, it's a lot easier to process. You can do stuff. You can look for like transitive relations. You can build a graph over it. Um, in the biomedical domain, again, there's lots of things you can think about. Disease symptom, disease uh, side effect, disease disease, uh, adverse drug event, temporal relations. Lots of stuff you can think about. Uh, just in case you, this might be useful for you, something called semantic medline. Trying to take the entire medline, turn it into a graph. Uh, nodes are entities, edges are relations. You can see here just some of the relations, they have more. So for example, some A affects B, A interacts with B, A stimulates B, A is a part of B, A is located in B, and so on. And, and the thing I kind of like about them is you can actually click on an edge and it gets you back the original sentence. So you can kind of debug, okay? So you can go back to the sentence and make sure that it, this edge actually holds and it's not just some parsing error or some understanding error. Can Questions? No? What? Hmm? Can you mark that this edge is <laughs> I can, haven't tried. That's a good question. I have no idea. Have you played with it? You haven't played with it? Okay, there's some other people who have tried to do the same thing. There is, um, I think this one was called Moliere, some French something. Um, anyway, it's yeah, it's kind of a hit or miss when I played with this. I think I had like 80% success rate in the sentences, but I never tried to provide feedback. Questions? No, yes. Am I going too fast, too slow? Give me something to work with. Okay, I see people nodding. I'll take that. Uh, just in case you're in, you like competitions, kind of Kaggle style competitions, what's called shared task. There's lots and lots of relation extraction um, from clinical notes. Competitions. I don't know, are you getting the slides after this? If not, ask me, but there's lots of places you can play with different kind of uh, relation interaction. Okay, more broadly, um, you can say, it's kind of related, but this is a more broad way to look at it, the problem of knowledge uh, creation, knowledge discovery. That just means you want to create new knowledge by analyzing data, especially textual data which is really just an excuse for me to tell you about my favorite task in this context. How many of you have heard about literature-based discovery? Ooh, excellent, I can tell all of you about this. So literature-based discovery, I heard about this when I was doing my PhD, a and it, it kind of blew my mind, really. I, I was so excited about this, I thought this was the best problem on Earth. So here's the history. There was a physician called Swanson in the 70s or so, and at one point he read a paper about how fish oil affects blood viscosity. Okay, then roll like a few more weeks later, a completely different context, and he writes a paper about how blood viscosity affects this thing called Raynaud syndrome. And you know, a kind of a light bulb goes up in his head and says, oh, I wonder if we can try treating patients of Raynaud uh, syndrome with fish oil. And he conducts experiments, and it works. And from this point on, this guy has seen the light, and he dedicates his entire life to finding uh, stuff that has been published in the literature, just nobody bothered putting together. Okay, so this thing has been discovered, this thing has been discovered, just nobody sort of trying to combine them. Now, I said I heard a thing, I was super excited, and then I tried to understand what happened since the 70s. And, okay, I'm going to insult even more people today, sorry about this, but the answer is not much. Okay, they had this super simple formulation of let's make a graph of. Um, um, kind of entities, and let's have edges if they co-occur together in abstracts of scientific papers, and then just let's try to close triangles. And there was kind of more or less clever ways of doing this, but that was the gist of most of the methods I've seen. Again, and so if any of you wants to play with the problem, I don't know, I think that's a really fun one to try. 
Um, okay. So, but yeah. the idea is, is essentially to make scientific discoveries by going to the library instead of going to the lab. Yeah, exactly. Or really, I, sh I should kind of have a disclaimer of thinking of a new potential direction for research, right? Because at the end, you come up to the physician and you tell them, hey, look, this was published together, this was published together. They're like, yeah, I'm going to need five years and like a postdoc to work on it. So unless you give me some biological mechanism, I'm not going to spend time working on that. But if you if there's something you care about, like some disease you care about, I think that's a really fun way to generate new research directions, new ideas around it. Um, OK, challenges. Why is working with text hard? I'm going to throw, again, lots of challenges on kind of no print. Well, there is some order, but anyway. First one is a core reference resolution. Again, take a look at this text about Christopher Robin. So Christopher Robin is alive and well. He is the same person. He, again, Christopher. As a boy, Chris. OK, now all of a sudden we refer to him as Chris. And again, for you, it's completely natural, right? Of course, Chris is Christopher, like you know this, but, but it's not a trivial task. And then you have his father wrote a poem about him. Again, he refers to Chris. But th this is called co-reference resolution. It's more annoying than you might expect, I would say. You say, his father is the same thing as Mr. Robin, and they're not the same person, although both of them are Robin. Um, anyway, just something to, that you sometimes need to think about. Ambiguity. Can you read it or should I read it for you? Read. Read? Okay. So, penguins is a bad news soul. I lost my wife. Oh my goodness, Morty, did she die? Now I literally can't tell which one she is. And we should really come with name tags. And the bottom one is uh, this guy saying, please have a seat. And this guy just takes a chair and says, thank you. <laughs> okay, it's ambiguity. There's multiple ways in which natural language is ambiguous. There's word sense or meaning disambiguation, where, where you just one word can mean different things. For example, Siri, call me an ambulance. OK, from now on, I'm going to call you an ambulance, OK? <laughs> That's just because you know the word call has multiple meanings. And Is this a real life example? I think that, uh, well, it's from stuff Siri said. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe from the earlier versions, where you could do a lot of fun stuff. Um, OK, again, in the biomedical thing, there's lots of uh, disambiguation just due to overloaded terms. PCA, that can mean multiple things in medicine, not even taking into account the machine learning interpretation. Um, OK, another kind of ambiguity that I really like, it's called prepositional phrase attachment and ambiguity. Take a second to read this title. San Jose cops kill men with knives. OK, two interpretations of it. Go. What? Well, if you if you can read it. The cop is stabbing someone. Yes, one of them is the cops kill somebody using a knife, and the other is. The cops kill someone. Yeah, the cops kill somebody who holds a knife. Right, then both are legit things. You can see really at the bottom. Uh, well, you don't know how to read poetry, I think, but this means the San Jose cops, what do they do? They kill a man. How do they kill the man? This is kind of the modified that explains how, with a knife. And the other one is not for saying, cops kill, who do they kill? And this is kind of a unit. They kill a man with a knife. Here are some fun examples, just for you to enjoy. <laughs> Once you see this, you cannot unsee this, like everywhere. <laughs> If you have questions about any of those, shout. <laughs> I think my favorite is the, the seven foot dot. It's just an awesome mental image. <laughs> anyway, uh, I talked about core reference before. That's pronoun reference ambiguity. Dr. McLean often brings his dog champion to visit with the patient. He just loves to give big, wet, sloppy kisses. Okay, so it, it's really important who the he refers to. <laughs> yeah, many, many ways in which language is ambiguous, and the, way, the fact that we manage to interact is basically a miracle. Okay, another uh, example I really like. This is a legit, grammatically correct sentence in English. 
Do we have anybody who is willing to try to explain it? <laughs> no? We have a natural language here, speak of your friends. Okay, basically, this means, so the, the word buffalo can serve as a verb meaning to bully somebody. So this means something like a buffalo from the city of Buffalo was bullying another buffalo. I, I always get lost around this part, but I swear this makes sense and there are people who are trying to expand the sentence to try to see how many more buffalo they can make and uh, well, still be able to have some grammatical structure on top of it. So yeah. what this is uh, not about I mean, them. This yeah. example goes to the rare cases that are really artificially constructed, but you might say that the worst case scenario is not necessarily what you want to solve. <coughs> no, no, that's just an example I love, so I showed it to you. But that's definitely not the worst case. And if you see like medical, clinical notes with something like this, run for your life. <laughs> okay, you're not supposed to see this in like any natural language occurring text. That's like a convoluted thing. Okay, more challenges. Languages is not, is not language is not static, it changes. Just kind of as an age test for everybody here. What does LOL stand for? Okay, that you know. G to G? Yes. BFN or B4N? No? Okay. Bye for now. IDK? I don't know. Okay. FWW? And the last thing? No? Okay. <laughs> so, so languages change, uh, you know, and it doesn't have to be just slang, it can be new, new treatments that show up, new, I don't know, new diseases are still discovered, but definitely new things come into the language all the time. Okay, a huge challenge, really huge one, language is compositional. Uh, I'll show it with an example of translation, but you can think about it in many other contexts. This is a sign of, um, wait, what happened? Caution, wet floor. This is the version in Chinese, I believe. Uh, if you use it to translate Google, uh, Google Translate, the previous version, okay, now it actually works, said carefully slide, which is very poetic by the way, right? Carefully slide. Why does it say that? So the, the blue part can be translated to carefully, careful, take care, caution, lots of similar things. The green part can translate into slide, landslide, wet floor, or smooth. What the algorithm used to do, doesn't do it anymore, is just take the first things and compose them so you get careful of slides. What it was supposed to do is take the caution with four parts. Okay, but again, it's not just that you can translate every single token and be happy with. Um, okay, some challenges more unique to biomedical text. Like I said, diverse formats, everybody seems way to trigger happy kind of, yeah, let's reinvent the wheel, let's reinvent our own format, let's reinvent our own stuff. Well, what I call multimodality it might not be exactly the right sense of the word, but what I said earlier about you don't usually have uh, just that. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm playing the role of trying to slow the... the slow myself down? Good. No, no, the, the, the speed of the slides, okay, the speed of the text is a bit fast. But the yeah. various format, um, yeah. I thought the original thing was lack of format, so... so the People invent all those formats mm -hmm. because initially there was free text, mm -hmm. which is worse than. Yeah, I agree, but okay. it seems like I, I don't know. It seems like people are like they have this thing like every now and then all too happy to say that there's no backward compatibility, or you invent something without thinking about how how it kind of plays along with the previous thing. So again, that's my impression as an outsider. If you see it differently, feel free to correct me. I don't know, I just know that the biggest problem is that the doctor knows at the end is I saw this patient and he looked funny and I, you know, and, and uh, the same doctor would write something completely different than the next, on the same, you know, you could read, you can write many different things in, in the No, but, but I'm not even talking about uh, things like the natural language, I'm even talking about just the format <laughs> of, um, say, how different systems interact with each other in the hospital how you interact with the insurance company, how you interact, like everything seems to be the, their own. Even if you take the natural language as a string, you just ignore it. Okay, that's kind of orthogonal. Multimodality is again, you don't just have text, you have text, you have numbers, you have time stamps, you have like, I don't know, medical images, you have lots of stuff and you need to kind of make everything work together. Ah, confidentiality. Ah, well, I'm not going to tell you anything controversial. Medical data, super sensitive for a good reason, but it's going to make your life much harder. 
you know this already, I guess. Even more, okay, so no, not insider, in a different kind of center in the Hebrew, we've been trying to get different hospitals to talk together to share patient data. The, this is really, really, really hard, again, for a good reason. But just to know that that's not the challenge that I usually deal with when I'm you know, playing with Wikipedia text or something like this. Uh, on a related note, bias, fairness, again, not a problem that's specific to biomedical, it's kind of the entire machine learning community, but in our case, it actually matters a lot, right, to people's lives. So you know, need to make sure that the algorithm is not biased, that your results are not just you know, for a very specific subpopulation, or at least try to be biased stuff. Um, yeah, that's kind of high level. Okay, here's the bad news. There's not one kind of open, free level, you know, even not open and free level, there's just not one tool that's going to solve all your problems, unless you have very minor problems. But there's also two pieces of good news. The first one is that simple tools can get you a really, really long way. Okay, can get you more kind of farther than you would expect them to, to work. Let me give my favorite example. How many of you have heard about Eliza? Ooh, that's three more than I expected. Oh, <laughs> more than I expected. Oh, how did that happen? Okay, I'll tell everybody else. So Eliza is a piece of software from the 60s, I believe, something like 64, that played the role of a therapist. Okay, and at this point, you know, computers really couldn't do much interesting stuff, and lots of people who interacted with Eliza actually believed there was a person behind it, that they were really talking to a person. Now, le let's kind of see uh, what, what it looks like. So this lady shows up and she said, oh, well, men are all alike. And Eliza replies, in what way? They're always bugging us about something or another. And Eliza says, well, can you think of a specific example? And the person says, my boyfriend made me come here. Your boyfriend made you come here. He says, I'm depressed my, much of the time. Oh, I'm sorry to hear you were depressed, and so on. Now, if you read this and you're not paying that much attention, this seems legit, right? This seems like uh, kind of a semi-normal conversation. But if you actually try to read it with more critical eye, you notice that Eliza doesn't really add anything to the conversation. Okay, and I don't know what you think about shrinks in general, I'm not going to go into this corner, but, but Eliza really doesn't add anything. And wh what's happening really under the hood is that Eliza has some really simple heuristic rules, okay, based on keyword matching of the previous sentence. So if you say, I remember X, Eliza will always say, oh, do you often remember, uh, do you often uh, think about X? If you say the word always, can you think of a specific example? And again, it works, right? Because uh, they're always bugging us, can you think of a specific example? This makes sense. But, but again, if you look more closely, it never actually makes a claim, it never advances the dialogue. Now, I spent more time than I'm willing to admit playing with Eliza, trying to make it break when I was a kid. Uh, here's one example that I love. One of those heuristic rules is if you mention mother or father, it says, tell me more about your family. So if you say something like, failure is the mother of success, it will say, tell me more about your family, which is not a response that any sane person would give you, right? I it's clear something is completely off here. But, but I mean, it, it can, it's a really simple tool, and it manages to fool quite a few people, okay? And it always, uh, and if it doesn't know what to do, it says, tell me more about it. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> No, it, it's really funny. Once you see this, you cannot unsee this, but, but it, it's relatively convincing for the first time. Um, what else did I want? Oh, I wanted to kind of, this reminded me, okay, this is kind of a random association. But how many of you have heard about uh, Eugene, the bot that passed the Turing test? No, yes. Okay, so a few years back, there was lots of noise kind of in the internet, and the Turing test, finally somebody passed it, you know, computers are becoming intelligent, we're all doomed, the usual stuff. So here's what actually happened. Uh, you know the Turing test, right? Yes, no? Give me some now. Okay, Turing test, the computer pretends to be a person. Judges are supposed to tell whether this is a person or a computer. So the, the bot that actually managed to pass, meaning to convince, I think, a third of the judges, that's the, the bar, pretended to be a 13-year-old immigrant kid. So his English was a bit clunky, but it was understandable. But most importantly, this was a 13-year-old with a really, really bad attitude. Okay, half the time this is like, I don't want to answer this, you're boring me, let's talk about something else. Tell me something about yourself instead. So, so whenever I didn't know how to answer it, we just go into full 13-year-old annoying mode. 
So apparently it did manage to convince the judges that this was an annoying 13-year-old boy, but not quite what you think about when you hear that the uh, machine passed the Turing test for the first time. And this is also kind of in the line of you have some simple tool and you manage to, to squeeze them. Second bit of good news, um, tremendous progress in NLP recently and a big variety of tools that can actually help you. You might need to combine them, but there's lots and lots of things that can be used. Okay. So, how are we doing at time? Good. So you have textual data. Um, now what? what? What's the first thing you do when you get the textual data? I'm curious about your opinion. Start looking at it? Good, yes, I like this one. <laughs> How would you look at it? Okay, reading a few samples, that, that's a good one. Kind of try to get your hands dirty and understand what this looks like. What else? Checking the size. Yeah, checking the size, the, kind of the structure, the number of records, the, the duplicate, all the fun stuff. But my answer is actually, I guess, I, I think it's not standard. I'm not entirely sure, but I don't see many people doing this. First thing I do is visualize, 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 like always. Uh, first of all, because it's an awesome way to do reality checks. Okay, and not, not just for textual data, but just for everything, right? You have data about ages of people. Hey, let's make sure that you don't have people with negative ages. Let's make sure you don't have like 200 years old people in the data. Um, but it's also a really good way to kind of get to know the data and get to kind of think about research direction. So I I'm going to start by telling you about some of the ways you can visualize text. Okay, so here's an example. You have text about the healthcare reform. Okay, not quite, you know, it's more along what you said, like the internet. So you have um, President uh, Clinton's initiative, you have Obama's initiative, now you also have Trump, not in this example. And you have lots and lots of textual data about this. You have news articles, you have speech transcriptions, you have legal documents. And, and what I would, the way I would approach this is just what questions might you want to answer? Is what was the visualizations might actually help you answer those questions? Okay, what's the most obvious way to, to visualize text? That you should know. How would you visualize a bunch of text? And graph. What? Like the text the frequency. Yeah, frequency. It's called text clouds or um, uh, word clouds sometimes. So suppose we decide to go with the speeches to the Congress, we take Obama's speech to the Congress and make it into a tag cloud. You've all seen tag clouds. Basically, they represent the frequency of the words, the, the font size of the word corresponds to its frequency, okay? Not the size of the word, the font size. So, you know, frequency uh, will be bigger. You see there's lots of talk about health, insurance, the word will, care, and so on. Now, suppose I just do this for Clinton's speech to the Congress and for Obama's speech to the Congress. Take 30 seconds, look at this, tell me if you see anything interesting. really need to learn to speak up. Or I need to learn to, s to hear better. That also might be... Insurance. Insurance. Yeah. Where does insurance? Yes. Yeah. So that, that was my first reaction too. It seems like Clinton talks a lot about the people and stuff and Obama is, is a lot more technical and about insurance companies and kind of uh, details of the system. Again, th this is a very, very high level view that's just kind of an impression. I would not write a paper about it, I would not come up to conclusions, but that's a really good direction for me to now go and kind of take a deeper look into. Okay, like, the, uh, is it actually the case that Obama's speech is more technical, more talking about insurance companies, and so on? Okay, so briefly, tag clouds can help you with getting some initial query formation. They have lots and lots of weaknesses. Uh, I think the biggest one that I don't like is it's about font size. So if you have longer words, they kind of take up disproportional large uh, area. Like ideally I would like the area of the world to be proportional to its frequency, but they're not built like this. Um, they're also really unstable, right? So if you if you recompute this for two things, you, you need to kind of go back and forth and say, okay, here it says system. What does it say it's system here? Oh, it's here. So it's really annoying to do this back and forth to compare things. There's no location information that's meaningful. Uh, and it does not show you anything about the structure of the text. We'll, we'll get back to this point in a second. And um, also, the, the whole idea of kind of frequency of single words is sometimes limited, right? Because words have correlations. San Francisco is not the word San and the word Francisco. Uh, sometimes they have order, they have membership, they have antonyms, synonyms, hierarchy. So there's lots of 
meaning that's not encoded in just a single word. Here's another visualization that less people are familiar with, but sometimes it's interesting. It's called the word tree, word sequences. Okay, it seems like you don't know it, it's good. So what you do is you feed it some text, like Obama's speech, and you type in some prefix, and it uh, shows you all the sentences that start with this prefix. Like here, you just type I. So I will not sign. Oh, let's take a group. group uh, I will not sign. I will protect Medicare. I will continue. It's kind of a really interesting way to explore text. I'll actually give you an example I hate, but I think it demonstrates uh, it a bit better. So this is from a kind of Craigslist type of ads. I think this is a men looking for women. One of the biggest patterns. I am married, but. Okay. <laughs> Mankind, yes. Um, another kind of visualization not enough people know of, but is sometimes useful, phrase nets. If you're looking for a specific phrase, like A and B, A off B, you can come up with this kind of visualization. So this is a portrait of the artist as a young man. You look for X and Y. And you see some interesting things, like, you know, there's a mother and father, there's a um, this kind of little cluster about the uh, body parts. There is uh, you know, <coughs> darkness, silence, and gloom. That, that seems to be what I remember from this book. You can do this on the Bible, on the phrase X beget Y and get the entire family tree. You can compare kind of the Old Testament X of Y. You see uh, God of Israel, King of Israel, Children of Israel. But you do this thing for the New Testament, you get a uh, Son of God and stuff like this. Uh, so so th there's lots of like fun things you can get with this really, really simple tool. Okay, one important thing to note when you're doing text visualizations, those models do not represent the text directly. They represent some model, like, you know, tag clouds is about word counts, uh, or they just shared you with word trees about word sequences. And you need to think about whether this model is actually good for you, whether this is actually what you want to visualize. I'll show you an example that I like, I really like. Okay, back to tag clouds. So this is taking a specific restaurant's reviews on Yelp and making a tag cloud out of them. Okay, so I get that this is a sushi restaurant most likely, uh, but, but it's not useful for me because, like I said earlier, it does not capture any of the structure, just single word. So wait, is it a long wait? Is it no wait? Uh, prices, high prices, low prices, role, w what role are they talking about? So what this uh, paper did is actually change their model, and instead of looking at single words, they looked at adjectives and nouns, okay? So uh, kind of combination of adjectives and nouns, so it's called noun phrases. And then they made it a cloud of those. So now you can see stuff like, okay, so they're talking about a long wait. They're talking about a small place and delicious everything. Good, now I can kind of understand better what those people are talking about in the reviews. Okay, does this make sense? If not, that would be a good place to ask. But see how, better. what? It's always better to Always better? No, but it depends on your use case. But here it made more sense because, again, when you tell me the word cloud, the word wait, I have no idea if people are talking about good or bad things about it. So when you add the adjective, you can at least see how many people say long wait, how many people say no wait. Make sense? But again, totally depending on your use case. So, yeah. is there a way of Realizing when the adjective is actually helping versus just irrelevant. No, I mean because it splits a lot of things into smaller things that might be yes. something big will disappear. So. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a complete research question on its own. Uh, it's called aspects in um, in recommendation, not in recommendation. In people who study reviews and they try to merge things because it doesn't really matter if you said good or great or stuff like this. So they try to understand what aspects people are talking about, like weight and, um, and price. And then for each one, kind of to give a distribution over not, not single words, but more like classes of things. Right? The simplest one is positive, negative, neutral. So yeah, lots of smart people are working on this. That's just to give you kind of the, the flavor. Um, OK, topic modeling. Yes, OK, people are nodding, sort of. Not going to go into the details, but in general, when you have large document collections, uh, like a corpus of documents, co uh, topic model, again, it's meant to be super great. The idea is that you said this uh, was generated by key topics. For example, I have newspapers articles. They were generated by some of them are about music, some of them are about sports, some of them are about politics, some of them are about some mixture of those topics. And each topic is a distribution of rewards. Okay, so the way to think about it is each 
document is a distribution over topics, and each topic is a distribution over words, and you kind of flip coins and say, well, this document, let's pick a topic from the, to from the document distribution. For the topic, let's flip a coin again and pick a word, and this is how the document was created. And you're only given the, the document themselves, right? You're only given the, the corpus, and your guys kind of to, well, it's not really reverse engineer, but it's kind of to try to find the best uh, set of K topics and what words uh, they correspond. I know this was super quick, uh, but I kind of suspect you have seen this before. At some point, everybody and their mother wrote some variant of the LDA paper. So again, you have documents, and then you extract topics. For example, you say, well, there's a topic here that has words like gene, DNA, and genetic. You have this green topic here with words like brain, neuron, and nerve. That's kind of the most likely assignment, given the scorpus. But what I'm trying to get is, is that once you have this thing, one interesting thing to do is to visualize topics over time. Because this is a corpus of na uh, natural language processing papers. And you can say, well, there's a topic that roughly corresponds to speech recognition. This was kind of hot in the 90s, and then it started to die out, and now it's kind of picking up again, and so on. So visualize things over time. And that's something that's often really cool to do. Um, in, in general, when you visualize conversations, you have many interesting dimensions and many interesting pro cross products. Yeah, you can talk about what are people talking about when, that's kind of like what I said earlier, what were people excited uh, by in the 90s, who times who is the social network, right, who is talking to who, who times who times what times when is the information flow. So who is talking to who about what when. So just to give you some examples of what you could do, that's an interim record, that's from uh, Yuri Laskovich. He took the elections with, uh, when was it, the Sar Palin elections. So X axis is a timeline. Each color is some quote. For example, lipstick on a pig, if you remember. Uh, the width of the thing is how many newspapers were mentioning this on that specific date. So you can see, for example, there was like this big spike here, and then it started dying out, die, die, die. So, so you can kind of see our collective attention span. Like how long do people, do, do stories remain in the, in the newspapers? Um, how do different stories compete for our attention, and so on. I just think it's a really fun visualization. Another one I like is visualizing a Wikipedia revision history. So you know Wikipedia, right? You know you can see the edits. You know you can see like all the different versions that uh, an article had. This is, again, another visualization that I really like. X-axis timeline. If you ever did like diff between two, two files, you probably know where this is going. Each color is kind of a paragraph or some chunk of text. And this is the way, like, going from top to the bottom is the way the article reads. Okay, so you can see, for example, this brown thing kind of started going higher, and all of a sudden they wrote this greenish thingy, and then it went down, and then it completely disappeared. This is better for abortion, so one of the most, uh, you know, interesting uh, um, things to edit on the Wikipedia. Just to see we're on the same page. What does this mean? A war. Right. A war, yes, an edit war. No, I want this version. No, I want that version. No, I'm getting it back. No, I'm getting it back to my <laughs> back forth, back forth. And it looks like, kind of like an oriental rug or something. I don't know. So it's really fun to see those patterns. Um, okay. So at this point, I would usually give you like five minutes, ten minutes to take a break. But I'm going from here straight to a root canal procedure that there's no way on earth I'm going to like be late for. Uh, so tell me how, how badly you need this break. Like, do you want a five minute break? Can you survive? We have a break at 11.15. Good, so I'm not giving you a break. Okay, excellent. I hope it's fine, guys. <laughs> You'll survive? Good. <laughs> okay, so this is about visualizing. And now I also wanted to tell you about, uh, after you're done visualizing, like, what's the... So what are we looking for when you visualize? from the fun before. So two things. First of all, if you really want to make sure that the data you have is what you think you have. Okay, for example, uh, and uh, that's a reality check, right? I go to some edit that I, uh, to some article that I know is heavily like uh, in war, I expect to see this. I expect to see something interesting. If I don't see this, something is bad, like uh, something bad is happening. Um, the other thing is, again, looking for ideas. So suppose I, I did not know about this, but I suddenly see this, I'm like, oh wait, so something interesting is happening, then I go drill down and kind of get ideas for research. Or the thing I showed you is Obama. If I'm looking for like 
ways to compare Obama's uh, a point of, uh, kind of point of view on healthcare versus uh, Clinton. That, that kind of gives me some high level directions. Okay, and but it's mostly for me the, the reality check thing. Like I need to understand that the data is what it is. Um, again, if you, and another thing is a, it really helps you understand whether the, your um, pipeline actually makes sense. For example, I think Han will show you in uh, in her exercise that she did something like just let's do the word count for my corpus. Let's see the most common words, and she had some really unexpected words in the top. One of them just had this like I was in. Um, I never know how to pronounce those two dots, something like omelette. Anyway, something that doesn't make any freaking sense. It seems like a parsing error. Uh, the second most common word I believe was zit, which I have no idea why it's there, but it, I just told her, okay, if those are the most common words in your corpus, now you go need to go back to the corpus and see what's going on, because those are not the words I would expect you to see. Okay, so reality checks reality, because, you know, I, I'll tell you another story about this. Um, a friend of mine um, downloaded his data from Facebook at some point, and he tried to visualize his social network. And, and he visualized the social network kind of like you would expect. So every person is a graph, uh, is, it an ed uh, is a node, there's an edge between two people if they're friends and so on. Um, and everything seemed completely legit. And then he decided to try the metrics visualization. I kind of need to draw on top of it. Okay, bear with me for a second. So metrics visualization, each person is both a row and a column, and you have kind of a blue dot in the cell if those two people, uh, and adjacency metrics, you know adjacent. Yes. Ooh, you're useful. Thank you. No, so there are also many here over there. So. Oh, there's one here too. Okay. Well, actually, wait. I don't know if this one works. I have bad experience with those yeah, things. Yeah. Oh. Wow, I have so much stealing two of them. Okay, good. <laughs> no, that's like, how many of those actually work? <laughs> Am I the only one traumatized by those? They never, ever work, ever. Okay. <laughs> okay, so what he did was, um, like, let's say, I, ID in ID, same thing. Um, and there's, can you see anything? Did I make it too small? I'll make it bigger. Close the window. Can we draw this in Anyway, bear with me. In JCC matrix, you just have like a blue dot in the matrix if those two people are friends. Okay, and the interesting thing is how you sort the, the IDs. So he sorted them by um, kind of a method that makes the clusters actually show up. Okay, so if you have a bunch of people that tend to talk to each other, you'll get kind of a relatively dense rectangle. Okay, so you first cluster those people, then you make sure people who are in the same cluster are uh, together in the matrix. And you, s you again see kind of normal things. You see dense ones, and you see kind of slightly dense, and, and at the end, and there's lots of random noise. Okay, and again, everything made sense. And then he did the smart thing of doing the same matrix again, but ID order them um, chronologically. Okay, so the idea you get when you join Facebook is uh, kind of higher if you join later and so on. And when he did this, he actually saw that there's this entire lower part of his metrics was completely blank, which you should read as nobody who joined Facebook after a specific date from my friends is friends of another person who joined Facebook after the specific date, which really makes no freaking sense. Okay, this date wasn't like yesterday. This date was a while back. And this helped him understand. Can, can you guess what's going on? Yes, no? The data is It was? Bots. Bots? Oh, no, there was actually friends of him. The, this was just him visualizing the, data the social was network. To a certain date. Yes, data, not to a certain day, but apparently when you query Facebook, there's a certain number of records that this thing is going to re return, and after this, it just fails silently without telling you, like, hey, there's more data, but I'm just not giving it to you. So it just stopped giving the data from a certain point. But, but you wouldn't notice if you just looked at the, the other visualization. Everything looked normal. So again, reality checks, lots and lots of reality checks. Um, does this make sense? Yes, no, maybe. OK. So let's talk about the pipeline of what to do when you're actually getting text for the, the first time. Now, I had some hard time deciding whether I want to talk to you about this, because in some sense, since the kind of 
the advent of uh, deep learning, this pipeline has been obliterated in some sense. We just say, here's my text, throw it on a network, let's see what comes up. But I think it's still important for you to know. Also, it's important in case you don't have enough data, which is oftentimes the case. So you still need to know kind of the, the classical pipeline. Okay? Good. The first thing you should know about regular expressions. I see some painful <laughs> expressions in the audience. I can relate to that. Just tell me how many of you know regular expressions so I know how fast to go. Okay, good. I'll go fast. So, formal language for specifying text string. You want to capture both woodchuck, lowercase, uppercase, single plural. Um, you can do fun stuff like this, saying, hey, I want woodchuck with the W being either lowercase or uppercase. I can do things like any digit out of those. You can do ranges, so you don't need to write this thing because it's really stupid. You can just do 0 to 9, or A to Z lowercase, A to Z uppercase. Um, you can do negations, like I want everything other than an uppercase letter. You can say, hey, which are really just another, did you notice, by the way? I didn't notice. Just another name for Groundhog, so I say I want either this or that, or either this or that, capital, low and lowercase. Um, okay, th those are actually important, <laughs> right? The previous character is optional, so you, this captures both the American and the British spelling of color. Um, okay, so the asterisk, the, the previous thing, I want zero or more of it, okay, so it can be O or U with as many O's as you want. Those two expressions actually capture the same thing, because this plus is I want one or more of the previous uh, character. Um, okay. Again, I'm going super fast, but it seems like you all know it. If I want to find all instances of the word the in the text, I start with the regular expression the. What's wrong with it? Capitalism. Yes, capital is the first thing, right? It means it's capitalized examples. I say, okay, you showed me the groundwork example. Here's my new regular expressions, T uppercase, lowercase. What's wrong with that? Part of other words. Yes, part of other words. So uh, uh, other theology. So you do this annoying thing that says, I want there with either capital or lowercase <laughs> t, and the previous character cannot be a letter, and the next character cannot be a letter. Okay, it can be a dot, white space, whatever, but not a letter. What about digits of the 0 0.1? No. What does the 0 0.1 mean? I don't know, but it can happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you want this, let's sit down and write the regular expression, but yeah. why on earth? Anyway. <laughs> Uh, uh, but I just wanted to show this process that when you write regular expressions, you usually go to. So you can do both the false positive and false negative dance. Oh, okay, I'm capturing this thing I did not mean to capture. Oh, wait, I'm not capturing this thing I did mean to capture. Back, forth, back, forth until it converges. Highly recommend if you ever need to do this, this website, Regex 101. You type in your Regex, you type in a bunch of test strings, and you, it lets you debug relatively quickly. Limitations and order, really, you all seem so kind of pained when I said regular uh, expressions. Okay, th this really captures it, okay? Some people, when confronted with a problem, think, I know I'll use regular expressions, now they have two problems. Th that's pretty true, okay? You need to know the syntax, it's super difficult to debug, uh, sometimes they call it write only language. <laughs> So, you know, reading other people's regexes is hell. Reading your own regexes after like a week has passed is also hell. Uh, if you need to parse some hierarchical structure, like JSON, don't even think about doing this. Use a parser. That's not a good idea to use regexes unless you need something super simple from it. That's your regular expression for email in a curl. You'd not expect an email to look like this, yet it does. Okay? <laughs> I don't even know why. It makes no sense to me, but this is the regular expression that captures emails in Pro. Anyway, uh, okay, so I'm going to go through this quickly. Python is really friendly for doing those things. Um, okay, this is what I actually want you to say. So, in case your data set has structure, something like log files, okay, so see, here's the time of the day, and it's always the same format, and here's your observation, the horse awakens, here's the time of the day, the horse goes back to sleep. You can write a pattern relatively easily to make this into something structured. And after this, working with this is going to be so much more, more fun. Okay, so you make this into this data frame kind of when you have this is the day, this or the whatever this is, day, time, hour, seconds, this is the event that happens. Okay, so you really if you have structured log files or structured anything files, getting the stuff out in regexes is usually a really good idea, despite all the horrible things they said about them right now. 
possible if you need to substitute it, but that's probably less useful for you. I'll just send you the slide, you know. So, regular expressions. I hate this tool, but it's useful. Usually it's kind of the first thing to do when you have uh, data. Um, anyway, and before you start using all the heavy machinery, before you start actually playing with the uh, machine learning and so on. <laughs> yes, actually. I'd actually expect ChatGPT to be a decent first step. I would definitely test it. I would not trust it on this one. But it should, yeah, that might be the killer application. What was the killer Using ChatGPT for writing projects and for you. Oh. No, I'm not serious, but it's funny. Okay, next thing to do on the basic pipeline, word tokenization. So basically you have lots of running texts, you need to chunk it, you need to split it into sentences, you need to split the sentences into words, you need to normal words. This sounds like it should be trivial, it's not. I'm going to tell you why it's not. First of all, even a question like how many words is sometimes tricky, because say you're working on a speech to text application. I do a main, a mainly business data processing. How many words are there? Do, do you count the ah, do you count the main and the mainly together? Like, wh what do you do with those fragments and so on? Okay, so in application where it's not, or you know, in Twitter when people write re weird stuff. Cat and cats, for your application, are they the same thing? Are they not? I w we'll talk about this in a second, but the vocabulary you need to know here is lemma. Lemma is the same stem, part of speech, and the rough sense of the word, so cat and cats is the same lemma but different word form. The okay, word form is the, the inflection. Um, okay, so issues in tokenization. You have stuff like, say, Finland's capital. Do you want to make it Finland? Finland with an apostrophe, without an apostrophe? Like, th there's so many options. Uh, if you have abbreviations like I'm, do you want to split it into I am? What to do with stuff like Euler Packard or State of the Art? Do you want to Again, lowercase, it has multiple ways of uh, writing it out, words that have uh, dots in them. Because usually tokenization just breaks everything when it sees a dot, but you don't want P, uh, MPH to become like three different things. So again, lots of, kind of nitty gritty annoying stuff, but you need to be aware of it. Okay, because sometimes it has an effect. And that's while I was not even talking about other languages in English. So let's talk for a second about other languages. French has the same thing, like l'ensemble, right, the ensemble. Do you want to make it like L? Do you want to make it L, like the, the muscular form? You want it to match the, the single one, right? One ensemble, one ensemble, oh, and an ensemble. Uh, German, German has compounds. Do we have any German speakers here, please? Yes, do you know what this means? <laughs> this is Life Insurance Company employee. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. So if you're working on German text, you need to add kind of a compound splitter on top of everything. Uh, Chinese, Japanese, you need to add spaces between the words, because apparently there's no spaces. Uh, Japanese, just to have more fun, has multiple different alphabets that are kind of intermixed within a single sentence, because why not? Okay, so, so other languages, I mean, English is annoying in itself, but other languages have their own kind of set of quirks. Uh, okay, word normalization and stemming. One of the first things you want to do, usually, you need to normalize terms. Okay, so for example, so think about it as a search engine. You want your query to match documents, even if the word form is slightly different, right? If you, if you search for USA without dots, you want it to match documents where it says USA with dots. So it's really a way to implicitly define equivalence classes of terms. For example, you can say, if I have uh, periods within a term, I want to delete it. There's an alternative that's not very common, I just want you to know it uh, exists, called asymmetric extension. You can think about it as you're using a search engine. So if I enter the word window, single, lowercase, I'm probably talking about a window like this one, so it expands to window and windows. If I have windows, I might be talking about the operating system, so it also adds windows capitalized, if I type Windows capitalized, most likely I'm not talking about those, I'm talking about the operating system, so it expands just to, to the operating system. I, it's kind of heavy, it's complicated, it's tricky, so not many people use it. Sometimes it makes sense. Okay, um, so more stuff people usually do when they get text, the, the basic pipeline, first of all, case folding, meaning everything becomes lowercase, since people type in queries in lowercase anyway. 
It makes sense. Just know that sometimes it does change the the meaning, right? General Motors, lowercase, uppercase, different meaning. The Fed versus Fed, you know, was getting food. Um, oh, for sentiment analysis and so on, cases often helpful, right? Like U.S. versus us. By the way, the reason when the movie Us came came up, looking it up on Google was really really annoying. So you have to type like Us movie and stuff like this. So, so there's two ways to normalize text, two common ways to normalize text. The first is called thematization. Uh, this means you reduce the inflections to the base form, to a form from the dictionary. Okay, so if you see words like am, are, or is, this is just an inflection of the word of the verb to be. If you see all this car, car, cars, and so on, this is just about car. This is always about uh, some word from the dictionary. Okay, so if you see the sentence like the boy's car are different colors, and you want to normalize it, you end up with something like the boy car be different color. Okay, and note all of those are words from the dictionary. Um, okay, that's what I said. Um, no, I'll skip the Spanish for now. Now, that's kind of the expensive way. You need to go to the dictionary, you need to kind of understand from context sometimes what you're talking about. Here's what's the second way, that's kind of the, the common way, the cheap, quick, and dirty solution called stemming. Okay, for stemming, you need to understand some basic terminology about morphology. So morphemes is uh, those small meaningful units that make up words. You have stems where it's actually what carries the meaning. And you have affixes, like prefixes and suffixes. For example, what can I say? Undirected, okay, un and then directed. Um, so stemming, again, is a quick and dirty solution that just tries to chop off suffixes usually. So, uh, for example, if you have automate, automatic, automation, you, you chop off the suffixes, right? T-I-O-N is pretty classical suffix. Um, I see uh, E-S here, and you reduce it to this word automat. That's not in the dictionary as far as I know, right? But they all reduce to the same form. That, that's the idea. So if you see the sentence, um, for example, compress and compression are both accepted as equivalent to compress, and you use a stemming, again, not lemmatization, stemming, you end up with this thing. Okay, so take a look. So for example, without any, right, that's not actual a word, but it, stemming really hates words that end with E. Uh, the word compressed and compression both became compressed. R, see R does not become the verb to be because it has no idea about the dictionary, it just <coughs> chops off the, the E, so it becomes R, A, R, as equivalent to compress. Getting the difference, one is going back to the dictionary looking for the kind of the root form, and the other is let's just chop off stuff and hope that like different inflections become the same stemmed word. And uh, stemming, we kind of for some reason use the same algorithm that dates back to before I was born, a porter stemmer. It's a really long list of rules that you need to apply. So, you know, first step does the word end with a S S E S? If so, make it just SS, if it ends with IES, make it just I, so you know, ponies become pony, caresses becomes caress, and so on. Step two, if it ends with this, do that, and so on. It's not very interesting. The, the point is that it's super fast, and it's working for most of the things you, you probably need. Okay, so if you need to reduce words to some uh, kind of, again, some uh, equivalence classes, that's a really good way to go. Well, not that I know of. Hebrew is really annoying from a morphology point of view, but there's a lot of people working on it. Um, I think I used to have a, um, there used to be a GitHub repo about all the Hebrew NLP tools. There is this one? Okay, good, so go check it out there. But I don't think there's like something like the Porter Stemmer in Hebrew. There's <laughs> Hebrew sticks. <laughs> um, okay. So the thing you want to keep in mind is that I it's often useful, for, again, when you go to Google and you search for cat, you want to do much cats, but you need to make sure that sometimes the meaning changes, right? Waste and wasted are very different things. Okay, so if it's important to you, you might not want to do stemming, depending on the application. That might be my catchphrase for the last 20 minutes. Um, okay, so part of speech tagging, another thing you want to do when you encounter text, dating back to the ancient Greeks. I'm going to get you some 
flashbacks from your high school, I think. Remember all those things like there is a noun and a verb, an article, an adverb, and so on? So those are the classes. Again, nouns can be proper nouns, names of people, companies, common like cat, um, you know, verbs, conjunctions, pronouns. Any of this rings a bell? You, you seem slightly traumatized, OK? And part of speech tagging is the task of giving a sentence understand the part of speech of every single word. Because words often can play more than one role, right? For example, the word back can have multiple parts of speech. If you say the back door, this is an adjective. That's the their, their, their way they say adjective. I don't know why, it's a really annoying uh, syntax. On my back, back as noun. Win the voters back, this is an adverb. Promise to back the bill. Here, this is a verb, right? You want to back something. So the part of speech here, yeah, like I said, you have sentence, you want to understand what's a specific word, that what's the part of speech it's playing. Uh, so for example, if your input is plays well with others, first thing you do is you understand what possible role and uh, roles each word can play. For example, the word plays can be noun, like plays like Shakespeare's plays, or it can be verb. The word well can be a whole lot of things, right? Like a noun well that has uh, water. And your goal is kind of to pick the correct answer. Um, that's the correct answer. Plays is a verb, well is an adverb, and so on. The others had no disambiguation. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, many uses. One of them is text to speech, because sometimes the way we pronounce the word depends on the role it plays, right? So is it lead or is it led? Uh, the example I gave you with the sushi restaurant, right? I wanted to have adjectives and noun phrases. So that's the way you would do this. You would look for adjective, remember asterisks, zero or more. And then at least one noun, you write this regular expression, and then you know what things to extract based on the parts of speech. Um, okay, input to a parser. Um, even when you work with you know deep learning and everything, sometimes feeding in addition to the original text, feeding the part of speech does seem to help those systems. Uh, and okay, this used to be true, not anymore, but it used to be like one of the most basic things you do when you get the text: the part of speech. And again, this example I showed you, you, in order to do this, you need to understand the part of speech. You need to understand the adjectives, you need to understand them. Um, okay, this just means that deciding the correct part of speech can be difficult even for people. And, 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 and wait, what time is this? Am I good on time? I'm suddenly confused about this. Yes, I'm good. Okay, good. Um, so how difficult is part of speech tagging? The reality is not much. So about 11% of the words are ambiguous in the sense that they can play more than one role, uh, but they seem to be the common words. So if you actually look at text, about 40% of the words in the text are ambiguous. Um, but oh, this is actually slightly not up to date. I believe now it's more like 98, 99%. So it's not as so far, but it's pretty much there. Uh, but even the stupid baseline is already at 90%. Okay, the most stupid baseline you can imagine. Just tag every word with the most frequent tag, and if you don't know a word, just say it's a new noun. Uh, so, so this part is actually not that difficult, I would say. Okay, part of speech is kind of a shallow structure. If you want to go a bit higher, read this thing for a second. This is a great remark. Uh, marks while I was in Africa. I shot an elephant in my pajamas. How it got into my pajamas, I'll never know. This is what we talked about earlier about ambiguity, right? So the two sentences here, I shot an elephant. Okay, again, parse trees. I showed you this earlier just quickly. Parse trees are the um, kind of more elaborate structure, not just part of speech. How do different phrases attach to each other? So I, here's the verb, I shot. Who did I shoot? An elephant. How did I shoot this elephant while wearing my pajamas? Versus I shot, what did I shoot? this entire subtree saying an elephant who was in a my pajamas. Okay, so sometimes you want to extract a parse tree and it gives you some interesting features. Again, it's an interesting uh, input to deep network sometimes, it helps. Mm -mm -mm. And again, the buffalo buffalo example because I love this example. Other things you should consider. This is again the traditional kind of pipeline. You want to remove rare words. If you have words that are under some threshold, just throw them away. They just add volume, and they're not giving you any information. Do you remove the entire sentence? Or just the no, just the word. 
Uh, okay, depends on the model. If your model is something like a bag of words, meaning just take the words without order, it doesn't make sense to remove the, the entire sentence. If you work at the resolution of sentences, then I probably wouldn't do this part anyway. Uh, removing stop words, words that don't have any meaning to them. We'll, we'll talk about this, I think, in the next slide. But words like the, uh, is, um, we'll talk about this idea of engrams and embedding, which is the, our newest and shiniest toy. Definitely a question? Yeah. Uh, on the previous side. So, this holds also to the state of the art that Chetik depends on, all the same steps are being done prior to that. No, so, so that's what I said when we started this part, that I was kind of hesitant whether I want to give this talk because the current kind of pipeline is just, here's my text, load it into tracks, put this in the, to a deep network. But I think it's still useful to notice, first of all, because sometimes you don't have enough data to do deep learning. Also because it, it's good to think about those things, right? The, the tokenizing and stuff, it's important to think about it. And because things like parse trees, like I said, <coughs> sometimes can enhance the especially when you don't have enough data, they can enhance the performance of those you know, super cool state-of-the-art algorithms. So the, the real answer is if you're doing something like, I'm just going to throw everything on the network, you don't need to think about most of those things. I don't remove stop words for a lot of the things I do right now. But um, I don't know, there's still value in the traditional pipeline, I think. I'm a traditional person, maybe, I don't know. Just say yeah. for railroads, you don't <laughs> What? Same for railroads, you don't remove any railroads in the belt and, and all these large GPT. Oh, and ChatGPT just doesn't have this kind of input, right? In ChatGPT, you just type in, like, in natural language instruction, like, here's what I want you to do, uh, translate this thing for me, write a piece of code for me. So, oh, like, here's a document, and you decide, and here's the task I want you to do. So, no, uh, okay. No, I'm talking well, about the free a, training. Like And they have they sub tokens to it. They also have sub tokens, so you don't understand this word, but you can understand something from the morphology. But but I don't think is that what you're asking? Because I don't think I'm yeah, asking the right question. I was asking about the pre-training for these large language models. Oh no, so you need any pre-processing of the flavor of what the Okay, so we'll talk about this in a bit. But in general, the pre-training of those li large language models are just here's a tech. Yeah, you know, ask me again after I do the word embedding. Okay, it's going to be easier. Um, okay, stop words, really easy if you're doing Python, there's different kind of stop word list. You just say all those things I want to get rid of. They probably are not useful for my application. And TFIDF, super basic, but super useful. It's uh, if you want to understand how important a word I is in document J, for example, what is this document really about? Uh, super, f uh, super popular, you weigh a word by, first of all, how often does it here in this document, like this document mentions Obama 20 times, probably important. And also, you know, this document also mentions the word that 20 times, but probably less important because every other document in the corpus also has the word that. Okay, so this is inverse document frequency. I think I have this more formally, yes. Okay, so again, you want to understand how important a word I is in document J. First thing you just do is count how often I appears in J. You can normalize, you might <coughs> normalize, there are variants. But then you go to all the other documents in the corpus and say, well, how many of them have this word in them? And then you normalize by this. Okay, so the idea is that you get high TFIDF scores if this document appears a lot in your document, but does not appear very often in other documents. Which makes sense. Yeah. Okay, no, so he's not going to work here, that's the co-referencing. So often when you do normalization, you do this thing of uh, cross-reference and you replace all the occurrences of it with some normalized form. Um, so, you know, you replace everything, President Obama, Barack Obama, everything with like just Obama, and then you can do those things. Um, okay, now at the very end, we get to the most fun part, like I said, our shiny toy. And this is about semantics. And semantics means that you can say the same thing in many, many different ways. Okay, like I said, human language is amazing, but how is it possible to detect that all those things you're saying are really the same thing? So <laughs> that's kind of a philosophical question, right? What does it mean, the meaning of something? 
uh, and the answer I gave is from the dictionary, but it's not a really, a really good one. The meaning is the idea that is represented by a word or a phrase or so on. What NLP used to do before, what I'm going to talk to you about now, is use stuff like WordNet. Okay, WordNet, you know WordNet? It's basically a dictionary, uh, but it's also a graph. Okay, so each word is a node, but it has a set of synonyms, it has a set of meanings, and it also has kind of edges that are things like um, uh, hypernames, like a dog is a mammal, which is an animal, which is a living creature, which is a thing, so on. Um, so people would use stuff like linguistic resources like WordNet to understand whether what's the meaning of a word. Okay, this is what it looks like. It also has very nice interface in Python. So they give me all the thin sets, all the similar sets of good. It tells you, well, here are some nouns, here are some adjectives, uh, some meanings of the good as adjective, here are some meanings of good as adverbs. <coughs> and, and the problem is all those resources, well, there's many problems with those resources. First of all, it's missing nuance. Because when it tells me that a proficient is a synonym for good, th that's only correct some of the time, right? Not, not all of the time. Um, it's missing lots of new meanings, like you know, the word wicked kind of changed its meaning. It's highly subjective, and it requires an insane amount of human labor to maintain this thing, to adapt this thing. So uh, what used to happen in traditional NLP is we used to represent word as um, in this representation called one hot. Okay, so suppose you want to talk about hotel, conference, and hotel. Each entry in this vector, okay, the size of the vector is the size of your vocabulary. Each entry corresponds to one word. Then you basically have one if that's the word you're trying to represent, and zero everywhere else. So this would be motel, this would be hotel. Okay, the one just moved to a different position. Um, so there's really no natural way of doing similarity, right? Because those things are orthogonal. Everything is orthogonal. I can talk about the, like the distance between motel and hotel is the same thing between the distance between hotel and giraffe. Okay, it really doesn't tell me that those two things are actually quite similar. And then came the distributional hypothesis. No, yes, no, okay, distributional hypothesis goes like this. Suppose I tell you, hey, there's this word that you have never heard of because I made it up, and it's guino. And I tell you lots of things about tesguino, like, there's a bottle of tesguino on the table, everybody likes tesguino, it makes you drunk, we make tesguino out of corn. Okay, so, so you probably get an idea of what I'm talking about. Same thing if I told you, hey, look, I saw this cute white fluffy wok monk uh, by the tree outside. Okay, so, so you guess what this is even if you've never heard this word. So the distributional, distributional hypothesis means that similar words appear in similar contexts, or that you can know a lot about the word by the company it keeps. Okay, and it's a really strong hypothesis and it's kind of the basis to lots of their recent progress. And uh, yeah, I said this already, one of the most successful ideas in modern NLP. Okay, and how do we actually use this? This idea of word vectors. So we switch from the one hot representation to dense vector representation. So we have a dense vector for each word and the idea is that you're supposed to build it in a way so that words that are similar, meaning they appear in similar context, they get uh, vectors that are close together in space. Okay, so the word for banking is going to be close to the word monetary, even though you know th they don't seem alike. Um, okay, that's word representing for word vectors, word embedding, neural embedding, whatever you want to call it. And this idea again super successful, exploded recently. You saw that they can do lots of fun stuff. Okay, I might be telling you stuff that you already know, but one of the first things that blew everybody's mind is showing to you that you can do kind of basic arithmetic with those vectors. So you take the vector for the word king, you subtract the vector for men, you add woman, and you get the point in space that's closer out of your entire vocabulary to the word queen. That, you know, when I first saw this, I saw this with magic. And it is like you can do this with lots of things. So king, queen, men, woman, the direction in space is the same. But you can also do this with stuff, simple stuff like syntax, okay? Walking, walked, swimming, swam, and so on. Uh, you can do this with country capital relations. Um, so Han is actually going to, the hi Han, <laughs> she's going to tell you more about embeddings. She's going to get you to play with them. This was just the very basic uh, introduction to the idea of embeddings. And now you can ask, yes. 
No, I, I asked him to come to give us some um, prep to what would be in the after the break. So what, if you leave a few minutes for that before the break. Yeah, I'm loving them soon. Okay. Please, Please. see. Already. <laughs> so a lot of things you could do with textual data. Really a lot of stuff. Lots of challenges. I think there's kind of a discrepancy between how we live in a science fiction world where we can suddenly talk to our, you know, talk to Alexa, talk to Siri, and we can do lots of stuff in natural language, and this, again, discrepancy of those things failing or stuff that three roles can, can do naturally. And incredible progress. Go look for tools, go look for ontologies, don't try to reinvent the wheels. If you're working with Python, Spacey and LTK, LNL, NLP, and the GPT gang are excellent starting points. Um, if you have questions, now would be a great time. People shocked. So we have time for a few questions before we have to run off. So. depends on your task. But I would try some of the existing pre-trained stuff. Okay, like BERT, and is going to talk about BERT. Uh, maybe even just simple word to vec would be good enough for you. It depends if you need contextual stuff or not. But start with this first. If it doesn't work, you can kind of, you know, um, you can fine-tune the model for whatever you need. But wh what I showed you was mostly for the case where you don't have enough data to start with those large language models. Okay, don't don't do stuff on your own. Well, <laughs> keep don't try this at home. <laughs> yeah. But if we do, no, seriously, we, yeah. we do want to go out there and go out and play. Yes, yes. definitely. But I would say don't say, say well, I'm going to go and pre-train my own large language model. You know, unless you have access to insane amount of compute power and money that you just don't need. And if so, come talk to me. I might have something better to do with it. <laughs> Uh, start with like pre-trained stuff. Iran or something like this because they actually have incentive to work on it. Most places don't have incentive to work on rare languages. Lots of places just, you know, take rare languages, kind of pass them through Google Translate, work on the English and pass it back, which, uh, you know. So uh, it's getting better. There are conferences dedicated to rare languages and uh, low resource languages, that's what it's called. Um, the, the community does try to encourage people to work on other languages. Not quite there, uh, but it also makes sense, right? Because I, I mean, being able to work on algorithms in a language that I don't understand is hell, right? Like, how do I debug this? So, did it answer your question? Yeah. Getting better? Not quite there. Yeah. 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 So that's is one modality for language. Mm -hmm. You see, like BioBelt and stuff like this, mm -hmm. and for, that basically use the uh, NLP techniques for uh, other modalities. Well, Nira should be the one to answer in this, I believe. No? Uh, I did. I, I heard only half of the question. So. Okay, so I was asking about the other, he called it modalities, like <laughs> proteins and stuff like yeah. this. Uh, do people still use the classical methods on them? Is that fair enough abbreviation? Because um, they definitely have done this, right? Before no, the I new mean methods. There, there are ideas yeah. of using other methods. Sometimes the 
So then you sometimes it's not. <laughs> no, I mean. I should get this on a bumper sticker. No, people have not. been doing, for example, DNA sequences and, and natural language. And it's not the same, but the ideas of going back and forth. Yeah, so, so a lot of people are taking inspiration. So w when I was doing a PhD, I read this book that says, let's treat machine translation as encryption. We made lots of progress in uh, encryption. And, uh, you know, and how about we pretend that this is just a sequence that is encoded in some way in a different language, which is a super cool idea and completely did not work, as far as I know. So, so lots of people are trying to take inspiration, like you said, with varying degrees of success. Um, I can tell you that, for example, I, I'm working on stuff like uh, pattern data, and I'm not even touching patterns in like the chemical domain because I have no idea how to parse those long molecules and stuff like this. So if you do this, I would advise to you know, get a domain expert. Anything else? I'm going to get the root canal. Fun day. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.